My title this evening is The Silence of Christ. The Silence of Christ. When Jesus knew that his time was coming for him to um, go through his sufferings and abandon this world, he met with his disciples during the um, dinner or um, to celebrate the Passover. After this, he went to a place where he uh, frequently went to was the garden or Gethsemane to pray. He took his disciples with him for them to go and even ask them to pray because he knew what was ahead of him. The Bible says that he was deeply distressed and troubled and even asked God to, if it was possible, to take away the cup of suffering, but not according to his will, but his father's will. One of the things that you frequently see in the life of Jesus was submission. Submission to the will of God. Submission to the Father. Jesus Christ, we can say in a sense, would rather not have suffered. But it was important for him to suffer, not because of him, but because of God. Submission to uh, the will of God. Something that we can learn. Luke described that moment as one of intense agony. It says that his sweat fell on the ground like drops of blood, and even an angel came to exist him. It was a somber sight of Jesus, ready for the suffering that was ahead of him. Soon after he was praying with, with his disciples in the garden, the temple guards came and they took him away. So I want to take you to the scriptures in Mark 14, 55 to 65. We're going to read this scripture. It says, Inside, which means the house or the building of the high council, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. He didn't say absolutely nothing. In comparison to his life, normally, this was a different side of him. His words were few. The prophet Isaiah described him with these words. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet never said a word. He was led like a lamb to be slaughtered, and as a sheep is silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. He used an illustration, the prophet used an illustration that he was familiar with. Obviously, in those days, they were raising animals, and he knew about uh, uh, um, the raising up of, of sheep, which was for wool, and also they would take the sheep to the temple to be sacrificed. And sheep are known for their submissive nature. So the prophet Isaiah often must have seen the animal being taken to um, slaughter, to, uh, to be killed, but they never resisted, and they went quietly. And it, is, it was from this picture that the, John the Baptist says that, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away, away our sin from the world. So Jesus had a demeanor about him in the final hours where he was not going to resist the attack that was going to come, come against him. His silence was very, very noticeable. Why? Because of the intensity of the provocation, and he did not retaliate. He did not say a word. Psalm 38, 13 through 14 says, But I'm deaf to all their threats. I am silent before them as one who cannot speak. I chose to hear nothing, and I, can, and I make no reply. I believe there are moments in our own lives that we have to learn how to become silent, knowing whom we serve. Jesus knew the plan behind him was the plan of God. And this is what I believe believers in Christ has to learn. If we say God is in charge, God is in control, 
when we are being tested, because tests come all the way, all the time. And when we are faith in God, we need to learn how to submit ourselves through the scripture, through his word, and allow him to glorify his name. God has a plan. Often I think nowadays people think we're saved to be, to be placed on a table or on a shelf like a decoration. No, God saved us so he can manifest his glory and he can work through us. There are many things that we want in life that God desires to build character. And these tests will help us build character in us. Jesus remained silent before the high priest. They brought false witnesses against him. And, but because they couldn't find anything, anyone to say something wrong about him. And in Matthew 26, 62, it says, The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Well, I'm repeating the same thing to you. Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say? But Jesus remained silent. Can we remain silent when false accusations is brought against us? And we know that why we're there, it is because of the cause of Jesus Christ. Can we trust him and depend upon him? Also, the same thing happened when the rest of the religious leaders brought charges against him. It says, when they brought, made accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. It wasn't a quiet place. It wasn't a quiet room. It was a place where they were yelling and screaming, saying things against him that were, wasn't right. And think, in, think also about this. Jesus was in those conditions, not because he did anything wrong, but he was because he was scared the sin and the burden of humanity upon him. So finally he goes in front of Pilate, Herod, and Antipas. Unable to say anything to him, Pilate says to him, Don't you hear all these charges are being brought against you? And again, in Matthew 27, 14, Jesus made no response. And Pilate was surprised. Because remember, Pilate knew who Jesus was. Pilate heard about his stories, how he preached, how he healed the sick. So suddenly, this mighty and powerful man that was able to set people free from demon possession, finally this man, they're accusing him, they lie against him, and he wasn't, say, he wasn't saying nothing. He was silent. Also, Pilate tried to talk to him again. He's asking him, where are you from? And again, the Bible says, Jesus didn't say anything. He remained silent. Then in front of the soldiers, the soldiers had a one that had a, 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 a great time with him. They stripped him from his clothes and they put a scarlet robe on, on him. They took thorns and they, wo and they weaved, um, wove a, a, a crown and put it on his head. And they gave him a reed in his hand and they knelt before him, mocking him and say, Oh, hail, King of the Jews. First Peter 2.23 says, he did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened, threatened revenge when he suffered. Can we do that? Can we do that when we are being challenged? Can we do that when we are being retaliated? Can we remain silent? Can we remain silent when we know we're right? Can we remain silent if the night before we pray, we said, God, give me wisdom and understanding? Can we remain silent if even God shows us, hey, I'm allowing this to come to your life because I have a plan. I have a plan. There's something I want to do through you. I want to glorify your name. See, when Jesus Christ came, the Bible tells us, what did he do? He submitted himself. He had all the power, all the might, all the authority. Imagine, some of us have all the money, all the influences, all the people. We can do great things. But are we willing to just Remain silent so God can work a plan through us. Are we willing to lower ourselves this low like Christ did for God's glory? I'm telling you, there's so much that we can learn about Good Friday, about the life of Jesus. It, it's not just a story. It's a story to live. It's a story that must be incorporated in our day-to-day -day living. It's a story that has to be in our mind, in our, in, in our lives, the way, the way we live, so God can glorify His name. God is looking for people through, through whom He can make His life big. 
Not people that goes around, yells and scream, fight for the right. You know, nowadays, when somebody retaliates, retaliates you or put you down, you're going to sue them. You're going to take them to court. You're going to make their life miserable. But God doesn't work this way. Jesus Christ had all the power, all the authority to do more than that. But because there was a plan, he silent, he suffered silently. Isaiah describes him as a suffering, ser- suffering servant. A servant, when you're, serving, uh, uh, when you're a servant, you're not allowed to talk back and have to submit yourself to the will of the master. Remember when Jesus was in the garden? When they came to arrest him and his disciples were ready to uh, defend him? And he said to Peter, put your sword back into the sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? He was saying, Peter, stop finding an easy way out. Am I not supposed to suffer for what God has allowed to come in my life? Nowadays, we run away from suffering because suffering is something bad. Suffering is something, uh, it's almost as if you have a curse on you. But when you put your life in the hands of God, can you trust Him that the suffering is a way for Him to glorify His name? Can we do that? You see, we have grown here in America, or maybe all the, over the world, that we want to live a life on our own way, outside, devo- devoid of the power of God. God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to save humanity from sin. And when Jesus died and he went to heaven, he said to a disciple, go and preach. And our life should be go. Our lives should be on the go so we can live the example that Christ has given us. And too many are afraid. Too many stand at the distance looking and they think it's only the preacher, only the teacher has received this commission. No. Christ, the Bible says, died for our sins. And if you say, He died for my sins, He wants you to become a witness and share the experience of forgiveness. If you say you're free, there's so many people bound in sin today, in addiction, corruption, in dysfunction, that desires to receive that freedom. So all these things are training materials. We're being trained. Become like Jesus. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is submission to the will of God. Submission to the will of God. Submit. Yesterday, we had a conversation um, about reading the Bible, an example. And the question was, how come so many people don't read the Bible? They don't read it. They don't think, it nece- they don't think it's necessary. They find it boring because they're disinterested and because of the love of Jesus Christ. And because of the lack of understanding that God desires for you to be changed. So we can use you. And the only place where you can learn about Jesus, trust me, is by reading your Bible. And with a desire to read it, and with the love of God, God will open your heart and your mind and give you wisdom for you to read and understand. He was silenced before his accusers and those who treated him harshly. And even when he was illegally tried in court, He didn't protest or appeal to another trial, but he submitted himself. Different from us today, isn't it? Different. Nowadays, if you have cash, you can find a good lawyer that will wiggle you out of any problem, anything. Money talks. When you don't have money, they will send you to prison for 20 years. But when you have money... They have the ability to even um, explain what is means to get you out of trouble. Because it's the power. Now Jesus Christ, he was the Savior, the Redeemer, the Lord. He was the man that walked among people and knew what, what they, um, they thought. He knew exactly what was going on in their mind. But he was standing there, sitting there. He did not retaliate. I love this portion. When Pilate one day um, talks to him, and I think Pilate says to him, 
um, kind of like they, they put you in my hands. I'm going to paraphrase to you. Yes. In the New King James Version, it says, Jesus said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. See? My sphere of power and influence is not of this world. world. If it was, my saved servants would fight for me so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. That's profound. That's profound. Jesus was saying to him, I'm living, my mindset, my attitude, my heart is in a different realm. Pilate, the only reason that you can be, be a leader wherever you are is because God allows you. Do you know, I was reading yesterday, I think it's in the book of Acts. It said, it said God is the one that makes people great. And God is the one that gives power. God is the one that makes people great. Only God. And this is what you said to Pilate, my kingdom. Where does it take us? That's why we need transformation. That's why we need to live at a higher standard. We need to live in the hope that what Christ has done for us, we can do the same thing. Oh, my church, we are clinging. We are clinging to the, to the uh, uh, material things. We're clinging to, to time. We're, we're clinging to pride. We are clinging to life. And we have to discover, learn from Jesus. He said, my kingdom. And the Bible says that we are citizens of heaven. When I, when, I, when I leave the country and I come back to the United States, you know, when you have a U.S. passport, there are lines. A line for green card or aliens, a line for people with a U.S. passport, and another line for people that can go quickly, that, that doesn't want to wait in line like, like, like I do. Citizens. A citizens give you entry automatically. We are citizens of heaven. What does it mean? It means when you die as a child of son of God, you don't have to encounter Peter at the gates of or the pearly gates because you have direct access. When you die, you don't need anyone to pray for you for 40 days or 40 nights. You don't need any intercessor because the intercessor intercedes for us already on the cross on Calvary to make a way for us. Oh, if we can learn to live in this realm as citizens of God, people that have a connection with God, that understand what Christ has done, what Christ did on the cross, isn't for you to just to read. Isn't for you just to dust your Bible. It's something for you to live. And it's someone for you to become a citizen of heaven. I wasn't born in the U.S., so I had to become a citizen. I had to take the test. Good thing I took in the olden days when it was cheaper, because now it's more expensive. They ask you all these questions, and if you know what, what a green card is, the minute you do it, they take away your green card, and they have to just wait. And then you have to swear and, swear and say all these things, and then do you know what you have to do? For some country, you have to refuse you're the citizen of your other country. So now when I go back home, I'm a tourist. I'm a tourist. Okay? Some place allow you to have double citizenship. I don't have that, that privilege. I'm a citizen of the United States of America. When you accept Christ as Savior, you become a citizen of heaven. Let's live like citizens of heaven. Do you know Jesus Christ was the son of God? And many people do, do don't know this. He was in heaven on his throne. And he looked down. But he never allowed his status to him. He didn't say, I'm too tall, I'm too big to go down to help these people. But he put up with rejection, oppression, false accusation to finish the work that he came to do. One of the things that qualities that Jesus showed us, meekness, calm temper of mind, and not easily provoked. Also, 
When you're meek, it doesn't mean you're weak. It's strength under control. Strength under control. I remember years ago, uh, maybe this will help you. Years ago, I was working in a place where someone uh, really, really did something bad. They put me down very, very bad. It really hurt me. It really, they knew I was a preacher, and they said something very mean to me, nasty. And I paused. I think what I did really hurt me. I paused. And they said to me, Siegfried, don't say it. That's what they told me. Siegfried, don't say it. Do you know how hard it was for me not to say what I want to say? Because I tell you, I muster up in my heart something more wor- worse and wicked and evil that he, was gonna, that he um, told me. So I didn't say it to him. It hurt my heart, though. Because <laughs> I wanted to say it. But finally, the day came when he was leaving the job. He gave me a card and thanked me. You see? But I learned a lesson. I learned that. That we have the capacity. Come on. Don't live so poor. Sometimes, do you know, sometimes I, I know we are sinners. I know we all fail. But it, sometimes it's crazy that we can justify bad attitudes. Hmm? Come on. Christ died for our sins. So once in a while, you can get angry. That's true. But it shall become your staple. That all the time, you justify yourself. Sometimes, I mean, people may, may, but there's always an opportunity to be meek. You see, when you want to take your tongue and slap it around, cut people apart. And you can withhold yourself. Why? Because you remember Jesus Christ had all the power, all the authority to destroy. And he did that. Jesus carried our hurt sin upon us on the cross. He didn't say much either. One moment he said, my God, why have you abandoned me? And scholars say because at the time on him, he carried all the sins of humanity. And God couldn't see the sin. He carried it. On his shoulder. So today that you and I don't have to carry the label of a sinner. But saved. Citizen of heaven. His last word before he gave up was. It's finished. He remained silent because he was looking in the future. At the end he knew that his suffering was worth it. His silence was worth it. And through all this, we see what Philippians 2, 8 says. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. He didn't die for himself. He died for our sins. With all the suffering that Christ went through, do you know there was a joy ahead? And I believe today, if Jesus was among us in person, he would smile. He would smile when he looks at you. When he looks at you. Because Isaiah 53, 11 says, When he sees all that's accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. Oh, there is a satisfaction. To be forgiven, to be washed in the blood. When Jesus looks down and sees you're saved from sin and there is a life eternal. That is satisfaction. As pastors, we have a hard time to see what we do. If you have a job, it's easy. Um, If you build a house, you can look back and smile. I used to mow the lawn and when I was done, I would sit down and... Just enjoy the, how, how, how um, the good job I did. When you paint, you can look back. But some things are very hard to see. <laughs> but do you know the cross? Christ died and suffered. And you are the proof. What a satisfaction. 
What a satisfaction to see the drop, the, the bloodshed, the silence. All has been productive. Productive. And we're sitting right here. And then it says, and because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to become to try righteous, for he will bear all their sins. As if they never sinned. Sin is the thing that keeps us away from God. I know, because I have it in my mind all the time, I'm being reminded by myself and by the devil that I'm still a sinner. But when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Bible says, it's possible for me to come become the righteous. And today, if I say I'm a righteous man, if today I said I'm not a sinner because I'm standing on the merit of of Jesus Christ. It's only because Christ died on the cross. I can stand here and say to you. If you come to him. If you open your heart. If you receive him as your Lord and Savior. You will become without sin. And have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Good Friday. It's about the story. It's about the opportunity. It's about what Christ has done for us. And Calvary. It's for us to draw closer to him and to realize there's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the faith of Jesus Christ. Christ was satisfied. There's no regret. And there's proof. So we hope, as God speaks to you, we hope as you claim your citizenship of heaven, we hope, as God may allow things to come your way that's not necessarily pleasing, and when you don't know how to cope with it, you remember the one that surrendered all his heart to cope with those things, so you and I today can have a relationship with him. And the thing that's so amazing is, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, you will be satisfied. Every parent finds satisfaction if they invested in their children to go to college, wherever they go. Let me brag for a few moments here. A friend of mine, one day I was in Albany, um, and my son was in the, um, what do you call it now? In the, in the guard thing. What do you call the, the? No. Honor guard. Honor guard. Honor guard. And um, it was at the egg at the 4th of July. So they mentioned all the names. I didn't pay attention to what. So they said to me, your face changed. And then I thought, yeah, I was. I felt, I, I felt like a proud dad. Because of when you raise your kids through challenges, it's refreshing to, to, you know, see them graduate, accomplish something in life. But imagine the torture, the pain, the hurt, the rejection that you and I can go through. And we can pray and God answers. And we can pray and God heals. And we can pray and God saves. And we can pray, and God transforms. You know where you came from. I know where I came from. I'm grateful. So I imagine Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, looking at us today. I imagine him going like, because your name your name, your name, your name is written in the book of life. Out of the grab of Satan and sin, what a satisfaction. And I hope this knowledge of the satisfaction that's in heavens will help you lift up from the misery in which you have been living for such a long time and claim it and say it's mine. 
in the name of Jesus. Do we have anyone this evening that don't know Christ as our Savior? I think everyone in this room knows Jesus as Savior. But I hope this experience will help you go higher, will help you go deeper. I hope it will provoke you to tears. When you go out on the street, you see your neighbor, your friends. You see those people that still haven't experienced what you have experienced by faith. What an amazing God we serve. Amen. We're going to pray. Let me see. Oh, I'm, I'm on time. I lost these services. I stay within my time limit. It's 7.53. I'm on time. I'm on time. I did good. So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's bow our hearts. God, you are so amazing. And you are so good. All of us are aware of where we came from. And all of us are aware. How much you have forgiven us. I pray. God Almighty that this Good Friday. Will help us enter. Into a deeper. And more meaningful relationship with you. I pray God Almighty. That we won't just come. As people that, that knows. What the Bible says. But lives. What the Bible says. Jesus. The word says that you live within our hearts. On Christmas, we talk about there was no room for him in the inn. And still today, we struggle to make room. As we look at the cross, as we look at the blood, as we look at your suffering, as we look at the satisfaction that you had for dying for us, oh God, may we open, may we, may we make room for you. In our hearts. May we be weak. Meek better say. May we have strength. Under control. May we become servants. Of the almighty. And eternal God. May be we people. That God almighty. That, 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 that knows the power. That uses the power. Given us to us. Because the power that Christ obtained on the cross isn't sitting somewhere. But it's a power that's available to anyone that experienced forgiveness. The blood of Jesus still retains and has its power today for anyone who believes in Him. You are so good. You're good beyond our imagination and expectation, God. You're so good, God Almighty. You're so good that through uh, expression of say, God, forgive me of my sins. Oh, you take away the load. You take away depression, oppression, lies, fears, and you change us, oh God. And the Bible says, into sons and daughters. And only you, oh God, can take sinners, oh God, that were damned to go to hell and change them through the blood and make them sons and daughters. So I pray, God Almighty, by your power and presence of your Holy Spirit, may your church and may your people and those that are online experience your love and forgiveness today. And we pray for all these things in the name of Jesus.